about to talk about Signalis. Why? Because it's untainable, unconceivable, unfeasible, unthinkable, out of reach, unregulatory, absurd, unfeasible, absurd, unrational, unrealizable, self-contradictory, untainable, contradictory, out of reach, out of reach, inconsistent, illogical, contradictory, absurd, unfeasible, absurd, unattainable. to understand Signalis. Trying to understand it is a paradox in itself. The game even makes sure to make this abundantly clear. Take the Penrose program, also known as the Impossible Triangle, the shape that represents paradox. At first glance, it seems like just another game, another story. But as you keep staring, the triangle's path no longer makes sense. It has no beginning or end. Its purpose is to trick us, highlighting the difference between what we see and what was real, if anything is real at all. The triangle plays with our perception, showing how easily the human brain can be fooled by visual cues. A powerful metaphor for the fitability of human perception and the idea that reality is subjective. Signalis is subjective. There are hundreds of videos talking about his story, exploring all the possible theories and the breadcrumbs that lead to nowhere. There are plenty of people who still have faith in piecing together a puzzle that is complete, but the shapes will never align. The Penrose Triangle, a symbol of persistence or futility, can represent the human tendency to strive for the impossible or pursue goals that seem untenable but are actually out of reach. Is this video even real? Or am I just another victim of a cycle? I've been here before. But maybe I'm just another video essay about an impossible game with an impossible story. One that will explain how everything unfolds, only to reach no conclusions. Or at best, tell you to play this game because it's good. It's what all other videos do. Can I even make something remotely different? Or is this video just another Penrose triangle? It doesn't matter at this point. I just want to talk about... Signalis? I've already talked about Signalis, it's the most popular video on my channel and even after a year, I haven't made another video about it. Usually that's what you do in the YouTube meta. If something works, just stick with it. But I didn't want to do that. I discussed everything I wanted to cover. I went through the story, the graphics, the controls, the puzzles, the sound design and the most terrifying feelings this game brought back from my subconscious. I did everything. Yet, here I am again like Elster in another cycle, searching for answers and yearning for catharsis. Or am I the one who wants to confront this once more? Signalis is an indie title developed primarily by two developers from the German studio Rose Engine. Development for Signalis began in 2014, totaling eight years of hard work. The game is a survival horror title that not only draws inspiration from, but serves as a love letter to the genre as a whole, with clear references to classic and influential titles that help establish the foundation for modern horror games. After its release, many hailed as a successful revival of the classic survival horror genre, with some even comparing it to Silent Hill, despite being its own entity. Signalis had a significant impact on the industry, surprising many, especially given that it was an indie title initially overlooked by the mainstream. It captivated players with its deep, ambiguous plot, creative art direction and game design that both honored and innovated upon the classic survival horror formula. This left both longtime fans and newcomers impressed with what the game had to offer. Furthermore, Signalis made waves in the indie scene, providing that a small indie studio could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with AAA titles from major companies. Signalis became the sliver of hope that the horror community not only wanted, but needed. But after two years since its release, 
how is the game holding? This moment still feels like the first time I boot up the game. The retro futuristic screen with that looping beeping sound in the background, setting a mysterious tone right from the menu. You get drawing so effortlessly, with the game presenting its aesthetic and atmosphere in the simplest way possible. Even after so long since my last playthrough, I'm still satisfied with how familiar it feels. The big blue eye tracking our cursor in the menu, the CRT nostalgia, the anticipation before starting the game, it's all still there. And now it's time to embark on another cycle once again. The game begins ambiguously, leaving us uncertain of where we are, who we are, and why we are here. Yet, it unfolds at a steady pace, providing just enough information for us to progress to the next piece of the puzzle. Despite the mystery, it starts strong, even without revealing much. We play as a replica named Elster, whose ship, the Penrose, has crash-landed on a unknown snowing planet. The commander who accompanied us, also known as a Gestalt, has gone missing, and we must search the ship for items to equip a spacesuit and venture aside to find her. Outside, a blizzard and a fierce winds make the journey perilous, with visibility reduced to almost nothing. Yet, Elster press on, suggesting that this person must be incredibly important to her, enough to risk her life in this frozen wasteland. A few steps into the storm, we spot monoliths in the distance. As we navigate through them, we come upon a vast crater, with a staircase leading to its steps. Descending the stairs, we find a hole in the wall, perfectly sized for Elster to crawl through. This is where the metaphorical rabbit hole begins. Perhaps this section symbolizes the player's descent into the unknown. The Penrose itself could be a metaphor, referring to the impossible triangle. So many connections can already be drawn in these early moments, but what if all this is just a facade? Our minds connecting the dots, but we might be being deceived. In my previous video, I explored how this game is a love story, a horrifying one. I drew a parallel to a personal experience in asking, how far would you go for someone? Of course, it was all indirect. I didn't review everything that happened, but the video served as a diary, a confrontation with my trauma. I needed that at the time. A year later, I still feel compelled to return and face this again. Perhaps there is still something to say. Perhaps this is hell. But what does the trauma have to do with the survival horror game? Well, it's evident it's references or elites to believe that you are making progress the more you look. This game is an endless rabbit hole, represented in sections where Elster must scroll to find answers. However, it always cycles back to a particular room filled with various literature books, a safe with three locks adorned by a thick, seemingly indestructible chains, and our first breadcrumb, a book with a cover that grabs our attention with its highlighted, saturated colors. This book is called The King in Yellow which exists and serves as the leading clue for many theories. People have read this book countless times, discussing its meanings, yet they don't even know if it's the original King in Yellow or the play The King in Yellow or maybe a fictional version of The King in Yellow. But remember, this is an impossible game, a Penrose triangle where our eyes are constantly deceived. The King in Yellow was written by Robert W. Chambers and published in 1895. But do you know what else happened in 1895? The invention of the radio by Guglielmo Marconi, an Italian inventor who began developing wireless telegraph technology, eventually leading to the radio's invention. Also, H.G. Wells published The Time Machine, one of the first works of fiction to explore the concept of time travel, establishing Wells as the pioneer of science fiction. Another significant event was Sigmund Freud's publication of his major work, Studies of Hysteria. Co-author with his colleague Joseph Brewer, this foundation work discusses the nature of hysteria and its treatment, marking a crucial development in psychoanalysis. It confronted contemporary medicine, which focused primarily on the physical aspects of the human body while neglecting the mind. 
This work delves into various themes and layers of hysteria, including physical symptoms like paralysis, convulsions, and sensory loss, as well as psychological aspects such as sexuality, repression, the unconscious mind, and trauma. The significance of this work was twofold. It laid the groundwork for Freud's future theories and marked the beginning of his exploration into the workings of the mind, ultimately leading to the development of psychoanalysis. This was important not only for the medical field, but also for understanding and inspiring a plethora of works of art, including horror and classic titles that many horror fans continue to dissect to this day. The human mind houses repressed memories, desires, and conflicts. Trauma shapes our behavior, our way of thinking, and our way of living. Facing and confronting it was what I interpreted during my last playthrough of Signalis. But now, a year later, how does it feel to go through this cycle all over again? You see what I'm saying? All those links I just made might not even be correct. I might be overthinking it, or maybe I'm on the right path. Either way, it doesn't matter. After we finish exploring this weirdly confined room, we are able to grab the book The King in Yellow from the table, starring one of the best intros that I ever experienced. Watching all of this again with the knowledge from my previous playthroughs and the research I did from my last video, I was surprised to realize that despite knowing so much about the plot, it still feels fresh, like I'm about to uncover something new, gain a different perspective, look at things from a completely different angle. The game is a perfect metaphor for a spiral. The more you play, the more you think you understand, but it's a cycle. It doesn't have an end. Alster is an unreliable narrator, as is Ariane and the files. Nothing in the game gives you a definitive conclusion. Even though I know what was going to happen, there is still something uncertain lingering beneath it all. We begin at the S23 Sertinsky, an underground mining facility where Gestalt workers are sent for re-education when they fail to meet the regime expectations. This section opens with Elster staring into a mirror, saying she's come a long way to find her, which feels like a clear homage to a iconic first scene from Silent Hill 2. Upon leaving the bathroom, we find out our first file, a welcoming message introducing us to the Sarpinskin facility. This is where most of the game takes place, as we navigate from room to room, collecting files that gradually reveal the connections between the guest thought and the replicas, and how this nightmarish chaos began. There's a lot of mystery behind these metal walls, the surveillance cameras tracking our every move, and the posters constantly remind us of the cruel regime that people were trying to escape from. There's a lot to unpack here. 
Let's put the lore aside for a moment and talk about the gameplay, which has received some great updates to its mechanics. As I mentioned, Signalis is a classic survival horror game, drawing inspiration from older Resident Evil titles where backtracking, resource management and horror are core elements of the design. In many ways, it follows the same formula, but with several key improvements. For instance, when the game was first released, it adhered to the Rule of Six, an important aspect of its lore that restricted both humans and replicas from carrying more than six items. Early on in the game, this inventory rule doesn't feel too restrictive, but as you progress through the game and encounter more complex puzzles that require specific sets of items and keys, the six slot limit becomes a challenge. While immersive, this limitation often disrupted the game's pacing, as it forced players to constantly backtrack to safe rooms to store and swap out items. Keep in mind that your inventory included not only key items but also weapons, ammo, secondary weapons for dense combat areas, utility items, and electric batons or termites, and a flashlight, which was essential for many sections of the game. By the end, you were typically left with just one or two free slots for the key items needed to progress. Now, however, the game offers some quality of life improvements. You can span your inventory to 8 slots, and crucial tools like the flashlight now have their own dedicated space, and no longer taking up inventory slots. Although I didn't use the 8 slots upgrade in my recent playthroughs, simply having the key items not occupy inventory space made a noticeable difference in the game's pacing. The experience was already strong before, but this small quality of life changes make the gameplay flow much smoother and add a lot to the overall experience. Combat remains simple yet incredibly satisfying. You press one button to aim, and a red square appears on the target, shrinking over time. If you wait for the square to get smaller, your shots deal more damage. This mechanic adds a layer of tension, especially when you are surrounded by multiple enemies. You start to panic, wanting to maximize damage while conserving your scarce ammo. Signalis encourages you to shoot wisely, rather than eliminate every enemy in sight. The combat feedback is also fantastic, thanks to the crisp and immersive sound design. Each gun sounds impressively real, and when you shoot, you can hear the bullet casings hitting the ground. Depending on the material or the type of room you are in, the sound of the casings changes, sometimes with a slight reverb effect. Its strip-away quality may be even better. This attention to details expands to the lighting as well. The game's pixel art is stunning, but it's the way light moves and reflects off objects and elster that always grabs my attention. It's impressive how much detail it's packed into a retro PS1 inspired aesthetic without sacrificing its authenticity. The visual design is incredibly well crafted, with the kind of artistic quality that feels like it belongs in a renowned European art museum. These small details are mesmerizing, and you find yourself pausing to admire the beauty. It's more than just a game, it's a canvas brought to life. When I consider playing this game again, I wonder if the puzzles would be as satisfying as they were the first time. Back then, the game was always giving up you small pieces, items that connected to something you saw minutes ago. It has a strong sense of progression, allowing the player the agency to choose their route. But at the same time, it keeps handing you keys and cars to unlock doors you passed just a little while earlier. It's a survival horror game where you're always discovering something new, and only rarely do you find yourself actually stuck on a puzzle or two. Solving these puzzles always feels fantastic, like when you find a keycard that opens a door to a room full of supplies. It's a perfect cycle of entering an unknown area, exploring and conquering at your own pace. Everything is perfectly balanced, the files, puzzles, keys and combat sections. You constantly have to decide whatever is worth spending resources or risking a hit to conserve ammo for the next encounter. This constant need to think and strategize leads to a satisfying gameplay loop. Revisiting puzzles was surprisingly enjoyable. I didn't remember most of the solutions, but I knew where to find them. Everything that you need to solve a puzzle is right there, in the files, a radio frequency, or within the environment itself. The puzzles are well designed. Nothing feels nonsensical or impossible, as there is always a logical solution to it. Plus, the game rarely repeats puzzles. When it does, it adds another layer of complexity, keeping them fresh. Signalis still has some of the best puzzles in the survival horror game, or pair with the Resident Evil 1 remake, at least for me. 
One of my favorite mechanics in Signalis is the radio, where you can cycle through frequencies to unlock new pathways and solve puzzles encrypted or hidden within those signals. I mention this because the radio plays a significant role in the story, from the very first beeping sound in the menu to various other moments throughout the game. It acts almost like a guide, but can also be used in combat sections. The radio defines the game's retrofuturistic setting. Why are they still using radios despite all this advanced technology? It's these types of items and mechanics that blend seamlessly with the story, and without the radio, Signalis would be missing one of its core elements. But why is the radio so important? Why do the sound frequencies signify? Is there a connection to the inventor of the radio, as I hinted early? And why is this game so impossible to fully explain despite seemingly simple at first? Is this even the same video we started watching? Are you still here? When I first played Signalis, I thought it was a love story about how far someone would go to save the person they love. But I feel deceived. Our perhaps my perspective has shifted. But I can trust my own perspective, can I? The game gives hints for the very first start of the game about the impossible Penrose Triangle. Maybe this wasn't a love story after all. Perhaps I need to go deeper, further into this rabbit hole that leads to another, and another, and another. another. Another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another, Until we are back here at the Sierpinski facility. This too could relate to the Sierpinski triangle, which seems simple at first, but recursively subdivides into smaller and smaller triangles, forming an infinite, repeating pattern. Another paradox, perhaps another clue that I missed something, or I've been unable to see the full picture. Signalis is a story open to interpretation, with a library of videos and forums dedicated to trying to understand what happened, but I truly believe we'll never get a definitive answer. And I hope I'm right. The story revolves around Elster, a replica assigned to the Penrose program alongside Gestalt Commander Arian. This military initiative pair replicas with guest thoughts on a no-return mission, sending them on a 3000 cycle expedition to find habitable planets for colonization. The guest thought, Arian, who never fit in, found an escape in this mission. Her love for art, reading, and radio communication, activities banned by the regime, made her life feel empty and meaningless. After discovering a photo of two soldiers from Veneta, one of whom looked eerily like her, Arian saw it as a sign. She joined the army and accepted the Penrose assignment as a chance to break free from her monotonous existence, a means to escape the mundane and finally live with purpose. But why Alistair is so dedicated to find her? Why is she so determined? As we enter the Serpinski facility, we encounter other replicas and guest thoughts along the way. Like Elster, all the replicas have different names, each representing their function. Elster's, for instance, is an LSTR unit, meaning a land survivor slash ship technician replica. Many other replicas are assigned to specific tasks and can only access certain areas. So when they see Elster navigating parts of the facility they don't expect her to be in, it leaves them confused. We also meet Iso Ito, Isa for short, who is on a search of her own, looking for her missing sister, Erika. Progressing further, we solve puzzles, collect files and unlock keys, each giving us fragments clues about the nature of the facility and its purpose. Oh, in one key detail, Isa shares that she was also searching for someone, but up until this point, Elster hasn't talked about her missing guest thought to Isa. After collecting two pieces of a weirdly shaped butterfly key to open a box, we find a hexagonal plate, and this triggers a flashback. We are transported to a distance radio station high in the mountains where Arian, Elster's guest thought, is isolated. Letters from her aunt and various items here gives us insight into Arian's background and longing for a peaceful life. We can also find a radio in this section that becomes really important, not just for unlocking a bunker door during the flashback, but also after the scene ends, as we somehow kept the radio even after the flashback has ended. This sequence repeats shortly after. We see Arian again, this time alone in the train card, a snowstorm surrounds the exterior buildings that were passing by. As we approach her, she vanishes, leaving behind a key. Again, we are thrust back into reality, still holding the key. These events create a sense of disorientation. 
how did we get here? What is real? Elster seems like a unreliable narrator, but perhaps it's the story itself that cannot be trusted. As we proceed, we collect more keys to open a mysterious door, leading us to our first boss fight, a corrupted replica. The fight is brief and afterward we meet Adler, the only male replica who seems to be the administrator of the Serpinski. He's suspicious of Alster and questions her intentions, offering some help. Alster decides to show him a photograph of her missing guest dot, but strangely, the photo is not of Ariane, but of another guest dot called Alina Seal. At this point, the game delivers a flood of information, but instead of giving us some more answers, it only deepens the mystery. You awaken in another flashback, this time as Issa. We are in one of Rotfront's military schools, mentioned in the previous files, but eerily empty. No one was around and all the doors were locked. But when we finally find an unlocked door, we glimpse Arian being bullied by other Gestalt students through a crack. As this flashback fades, Elsa emerges from an elevator shaft filled with countless bodies, piled up corpses of other Elster units. How many times has Elster been here before? Moving to another section of the game, we see the same principle, the same cycle. We progress from room to room, collect the items and keys to unlock doors that lead to new areas, uncovering different puzzles and advancing the lore through various files. This time we learn more about Adler. After descending into yet another hole, a cutscene shows Adler offering Isa help. Isa seems genuinely frightening by him and she's right about it. We then explore Edler's personal quarters, where we find two diaries. One diary contains mundane descriptions of his daily tasks, but the second is hidden within a sealed box. After solving the puzzle to unlock it, we discover a far more unsettling journal. The dates in this diary are all marked with the same day, and Edler claims no memory of writing it. As if he's trapped in an endless cycle, much like the facility itself, this suggests that Adler is caught in something that he cannot escape, both mentally and physically. In this section we also encounter Falk, an advanced replica model that uses bioresonance. While the game doesn't fully explain bioresonance, fan theory suggests is a powerful force, possibly tied to life creation with godlike elements central to the universe's existence. Each facility has a Falk unit as its commander, overseeing operations and security. However, when we find Falk, she appears to be in a deep, almost comatose state. Through further investigation, we learn that Falk wants to venture into the mines and encounter something known as the Red Gate. When she crossed this gate, she was affected by Ariane's bioresonance. Yes, Ariane is revealed to be a powerful entity within the game's lore, and her influence is now tied to Falk as well. We will explore Ariane's significance more deeply later, but for now, it's essential to understand that these powers connect them. After thoroughly exploring this section, we gain access to the elevator that takes us straight to the mines, supposedly where the guest of workers reside. As we descend deeper, we encounter Issa and Adler again. This time Adler is armed and he seems to be losing it. Issa fortunately has a knife and manages to stab Adler in the eye, causing him to fall into this massive crater. We soon find ourselves standing at the edge of this same crater, faced with the option to jump down.
if this video was already confusing, now it's completely unreliable. Welcome to Nowhere, a place clearly inspired by Silent Sea or the world. It has everything. Creepy, rusty metal floors, unsettling sounds, and an eerie atmosphere with even more holes and flesh. Of course, it constantly deceives us. When you try to go through a door on the left, you end up on the right. This is a mess, both literally and metaphorically. The game keeps disorienting us, and at this point, everything feels confusing and overwhelming, perfectly represented through the sound design, the puzzles and the numerous keys. The constant back and forth makes this part a nightmare in itself. After surviving this hell, we encounter Issa once more, but this time she's being attacked by a creature with multiple hands fused with a metal casing. We need to fire a few shots while waiting for Issa to load her rifle and finish the creature off. Unfortunately, the recoil is so strong that Issa faints afterward. We carry her to a room where she can rest while we search for a way to escape. I really love this level because of how the difficult ramps up and how cool and rewarding it feels to solve the sequence of puzzles here. I even had to use a pen and paper to map out the solutions for each door. Some might argue that this breaks immersion by taking you out of the game, but I generally enjoy this kind of challenge. It reminds me of older survival horror titles where I used to keep scraps of paper with all the door codes I found during my playthrough. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Dino Crisis. Remember the hexagonal item we found before the radio station flashback? Now we need to find five more hexagonal plates to unlock the next door. Beyond it, we find ourselves in a disturbingly familiar place. Oh, it's the same crater from the beginning, but now in a totally hellish version. The Red Gate. The same one Falk went through, but this time... Adler's here, telling us that he has been here many times before but never returned. He also talks about the time Falk crossed the gate and came back sick, completely changed from who she used to be. Perhaps as a warning to Alistair not to cross the gate. But we don't care, because our guest thought is awaiting for us. Perhaps this is where everything ends. It's time to finally meet our guest thought. Arian.
comes back to the pain rose, the vaso, the program, the triangle. We keep cycling back to the beginning as if that's how it meant to be, endlessly repeating the cycle. Elster is trapped, Adler is trapped, and Falk is trapped. This is the never ending trauma of doing everything for someone only to hurt yourself in the end. The journey of believing you are right, only to realize you are wrong all along. It's a love story with a true ending, a real ending. This is how it's supposed to go. Love is exhausting and traumatic. It's the same impossible circle, the unsolvable Penrose paradox that we endlessly caught in. Perhaps this is hell. Thank you so much for watching this video. As I revised a game that is definitely one of my favorites, but still leaves me feeling hurt. The story means a lot to me, which is why it's hard sometimes to express my thoughts. It's really difficult to find the right words to talk about this game. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Stay awesome, stay safe, and don't forget. Why? Because it's untainable, unconceivable, unfeasible, unthinkable, unthinkable reach, contradictory, absurd, unfeasible, absurd, impractical, unrealizable, self-contradictory, untainable, contradictory, unreach, unreach, inconsistent, illogical, contradictory, absurd, illogical, feasible, absurd, unthinkable, unrealizable. It is impossible to understand Signalis. Trying to understand it is a paradox in itself. The game even makes sure to make this abundantly clear. Take the Sierpinski facility, also known as the Sierpinski Triangle, the shape that represents paradox. At first glance, it seems like just another game, another story. But as you keep staring, the triangle's path no longer makes sense. It has no beginning or end. Its purpose is to trick us highlighting the difference between what we see and what was real. If anything is real at all, the triangle plays with our perception, showing how easily the human brain can be fooled by visual cues. A powerful metaphor for the fatability of human perception and the idea that reality is subjective. Signalis is subjective. There are hundreds of videos talking about the story, exploring all the possible theories and the breadcrumbs that lead to nowhere. There are plenty of people who still have faith in piecing together a puzzle that is complete, but the shapes will never align. The Serpiskin Triangle, a symbol of persistence or futility, can represent the human tendency to strive for the impossible or pursue goals that seem untenable but are actually out of reach. Are you still watching this? Are you sure this is not another cycle? You've been here before, but maybe I'm just another video essay about an impossible game with an impossible story. One that will explain how everything unfolds, only to reach no conclusions. Or at best, tell you to play this game because it's good. It's what all other videos do. Can I even make something remotely different? Or this video is just another certain skin triangle. It doesn't matter at this point. I just want to talk about Signalis. The game begins introducing our character, Alster, a replica assigned to the Painrose program alongside her guest star, Ariane. At the start of the journey, 
neither Alistair or Ariane were particularly talkative with each other. They were simply focused on their respective tasks. Alistair maintained the ship, while Ariane spent her time painting, watching movies, and indulging in everything she had always wanted to do, without the restrictions of the government or Bruce. For the first time, she was free to live her own life. However, as the time passed, Ariana began to feel homesick and miss the sense of connection. So she decided to slowly start talking with Elster. And bit by bit, they bonded. Ariana shared her passion for art, showed Elster her paintings and process, and they spent time watching movies together. This moments strengthened their friendship. Or perhaps something more. This is not the end. Like I said, we've been deceived. Wake up right where we left off, just seconds away from returning to the Penrose. Alistair regains her strength and Arian reminds her of their promise. Alistair is on the verge of death, with a missing arm and exposed circuits and organs. Yet, she still managed to put herself together. She climbs up aboard the Penrose, finding the ship in complete disrepair, infected by a pulsating flash covering much of its structure. Elster heads straight to the cryopod at the back of the ship, only to find another corpse of herself, this one wearing different armor. Elster decides to take the armor pieces from this fallen Elster model to repair herself, adding the new white armor she just found. And now fixed, Elster is ready to continue her journey to find her guest dot, her love, Arian. We are back in the Sarpinski facility, repeating the same steps, the same cycle. However, this time, the flesh that was infecting both Nowhere and the ship is now here too, covering the walls and blocking doors that were previously accessible. It's a far more disturbing version of the game's beginning, but it didn't take long for us to discover that this was just the game tricking us again, inviting us to dive even further. And without thinking, this is what Alistair decides to do. This is the end game. The final cycle we must navigate to fulfill Arian's promise. I really enjoy this section. The puzzles here are the best in the game, especially the radio antenna puzzle. You have to use an old computer with data disks to align the antenna to a specific frequency, which unlocks a box. It is a clever combination of mechanics we've encountered throughout the game, and they are integrated in a way that's not obvious, but very rewarding. Plus, there are far more enemies in this part. This is when I started using Termite to take out the larger enemies that were difficult to bypass without getting hit, knowing I'd need to backtrack later. Reducing enemies along the way became a smart strategy to make this section a bit easier. While exploring, I encounter Issa again, perhaps for the last time. 
She seems numb and lifeless, confessing that she couldn't find her sister because Erica was never really there. She had died in the war and Isa herself had also died. Like Alistair, she wasn't supposed to be here. After enduring so much to find her sister, Isa finally realizes that it was all for nothing. in this section involves finding six tarot cards, each representing a planet from the game. Once collected, you arrange them on a table and use the UV lights to reveal the hidden symbols, which form the combination needed to open another hole in the wall. And where does this hole lead? Back to the beginning. We find ourselves back in the same room from the beginning of the game, Arian's room. The same items are there, the books, the radio, and the king in yellow. But this time, picking up the book unlocks a door besides us, leading to another part of Arian's house. We come across files detailing Arian's wish to join the army so she could be assigned to the Painrose program, offering more of her backstory. We can also gather several items before heading through the door to our final destination, Falk. Falk is the final boss fight. As mentioned earlier, she has been corrupted by bioresonance, so we need to defeat her before returning to Arian. The battle is relatively straightforward. You wait for her to summon golden spears, and please make sure to have an empty inventory slot to pick up a spear. After shooting her a few times, she will stagger, allowing us to thrust the spear through her head. Repeat this process a couple of times, and you will be finally free. We return to the Red Gate one last time, and Adler is there, transformed and corrupted after crossing the gate. He questions Alistair, asking if she really wants to go through this again after seeing the consequences. But Alistair is determined. When Adler tries to stop her by gouging her eye, she shuts back, leaving him crawling on the ground, begging her to not continue. But it's too late. Alistair presses forward knowing she's close to fulfilling Arian's promise. This time, Elster climbs the pain rose, opens the hatch and enters the ship. Inside, the vessel is in ruins, simply abandoned and waiting for her return. There are files describing the aftermath of the pain rose program, revealing that it was a no-return assignment. If no habitable planet was found, there was no coming back. This is what happened to Elster and Arian. After 3,000 cycles together, what Arian thought was a peaceful life alongside someone she loved turned out to be a temporary dream. Alert informed them to stop trying to survive and to accept their fate. The replicas were designed to outlive their guest thought. So if the Penrose program reached at this point of no return, the guest thought could order the replica to grant them a merciful death. Arian was slowly being poisoned by leaking radiation and her condition deteriorated. Her hair turned white and her body weakened. She got cancer, killing her little by little. Despite Arian's request for Alistair to end her suffering, Alistair couldn't bring herself to do it. She refused, clinging to her loved one for as long as she could. This was Arian's promise, to be granted a peaceful death, but Alistair couldn't fulfill it. As Arian's condition worsened, she chose to hibernate in the ship's cryopod, waiting for the cancer to take her away.
After an unknown amount of time, Alistair finally returns to see Arian again. We enter the cryopod chamber, and there she is, Arian, the one Alistair loves. Alistair kneels beside her, saying she has come back for her, but Arian no longer remember her. Alistair, defeated, slowly fades into the ground, asking for one last wish, to stay by Arian's side, as another cycle comes to an end. The first time I played Signalis, I interpreted it as a horror story with love as one of its foundations. How the game takes something familiar and mundane and transforms into a nightmare. The monsters felt secondary. The true horror was in the mystery and the cosmic threats we couldn't fully understand. It was the unsettling feeling of having all the pieces but being unable to put everything together. Signalis is a masterclass in both horror and storytelling. Upon returning to the game to confront my trauma from past relationships, my interpretation deepened. It's still a love story intertwined with horror, but it's far more disturbing than I initially realized. If you're being paying close attention, you might be asking, who is Elster? A replica, right? Yes, but she was once human. There are files in the game that detail the known issues with each replica model. At one point, we come across a sealed envelope addressed to Arian that speaks specifically about Alster, but Arian ignored it. Upon opening this envelope, we uncover more about Alster's past, which ties her deeply to her human experience she's trying to hold on to. Alster units were chosen for the Penrose program for their adaptability and reliability under long-term isolation conditions, stoic and reserve. Alster units have a relatively stable neural pattern. It's best for you to leave it alone and interact with the Alster unit as little as possible. Alster neural pattern was a soldier of Vinatan origin, so their needs are basic. Avoid taking to Alster unit about the war. Penrose vessels are fitted with a specialized calibration pod which may help with the persona stabilization. To avoid resurfacing of guest on memories, do not show or give the Alster unit photographs, especially of soldiers during the war. Do not show Alster unit movies or let it listen to music. Do not try to befriend with the Elster unit. Yes, Elster was also a soldier, the same one who appears in the burn photo she carries with her. The woman beside her in the photo was her love, Alina Sio. This is where the story enters a speculative territory. With various theories about the woman on the left with her eye covered in bandages, some suggest this could be Lilith Ito or Anna Huang, but we don't know for certain. What we do know is that Alster Nero imprint was based on a soldier from the war in Veneta, which might be this girl with bandages and her consciousness was uploaded to create the replica we play as. This is further supported when Arian sees a picture of Elena Saw and she becomes visibly unsettled by their striking resemblance. This connection explains why Alster begins to develop feelings for Arian. It might not be entirely new emotions, but memories of her past relationship with Alina. The bond becomes even more complicated when considering how much of the story seems fragmented and dreamlike. Adler's diary reveals that he and Falk experienced dreams about a white-haired woman, adding another layer of the mystery. Arian's bioresonance powers hinted to be extremely potent and linked to the creation of life itself, further complicating things. It's possible that the entire game takes place within Arian's subconscious, a world she controls and where the cycle endlessly repeats. The environments Alistair navigates, the radio station, the mountains, the beach, all are tied up to Arian's life and passions. The flash that appears towards the end of the game could represent Arian's cancer, a physical manifestation of the disease spreading within her. 
In this interpretation, Elsa is trapped in Arian's world. This destiny to repeat the cycle over and over. Her love for Arian might be real, or perhaps it's a manipulation, driven by the memories of her past life as a Veneta soldier. Or maybe everything is part of an endless loop, and Elster will always die for a love she believes to be true, but was never truly real. But that's what love can do to you, right? Even when it seems impossible and even when the odds are stacked against you, you still try. Love pulls you through hell, as it does for Alster. Maybe she truly loves Arian, and maybe Arian isn't deceiving her. Or maybe my interpretation, our interpretation is completely wrong. Like I said, it doesn't matter. If you meant going through an endless cycle of suffering all over again, how far would you go for someone? Okay, let's do this all over again. For Arian. Okay, solve this puzzle. Another boss fight. Okay, here we are again. Elster fail once again. Okay, this time I can do this. Elster can do this. Again and again and again. I played through the game, experiencing all those cycles again just for this video. And in the end, I found myself truly understanding what I wanted to say. I confronted a trauma that no longer feels like a big deal. I've gained a new perspective, grew stronger, and felt comfortable talking about it now. Signalis remains my favorite horror game and if you haven't played yet, you definitely should. It's a rare gem that only comes around once in a while. So, maybe give it a try. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like to share the, your experience or talk about the game, feel free to leave a comment below. We can start a discussion, always with respect. And don't forget to like and subscribe to support the channel and help me make YouTube my full-time job. Stay awesome, stay safe, and don't forget. <laughs>